You look good today. Oh, that's good. You do too. I like your beard. So. Thank you. That really adds a lot of character. Um, okay, so uh, I'm Edwin Rutch, and I'm with uh, Kyler Davenport. We're doing a Needs of Empathy interview. So I'm wanting to interview you about your experiences and and uh, needs for empathy in your life. Um, so can you just tell me, I guess we'll just start with, uh, tell me a little bit about yourself, and then we'll dig in a little bit more, like your your Kyler Davenport, your age, where you live, what you do. Well, I am Kyler Davenport, and I am Senior Executive Producer for DestinyRadioNetwork.com. I'm on BlogTalkRadio.com and TalkShoe.com and MSIRadio.com in the UK, uh, as well as We Roar Network. I'm on Kill. Uh, I'm on the Cabal, Killing the Cabal, I believe it is, with uh, Mr. Stephen Roberts, one of my co-producers. And we've built this network up from the ground. I'm 57 years old. I uh, started in the dead body business at 14 years old, working for a funeral home uh, at a very, very young age and dealing with death and dying. I was a caregiver at a very, very young age. And by the way, that's Cancel the Cabal with Mr. Stephen Roberts that we're so intimately involved with over there. I made a mistake on that name. Got started in the dead body business very early, and the reason I'm telling uh, telling this story is because it'll lead into what your interview is about with me. Um, I was embalming. I was assisting in autopsies at 14 years old. At the funeral home, we used to actually do the autopsies at the funeral home. I was dragging dead bodies around, picking them up, uh, taking them to the morgue, bringing them from the morgue, working in the decomp room, working with the MEs. Uh, had a crematorium down the street from us where we would burn bodies. It was kind of like I'd ride my bicycle down there and help the embalmers and the crematorium personnel burn bodies. We burned babies. We burned adults. Uh, we burned folks from all cultures, creeds, and traditions. I got very interested in forensic science at a young age. And I moved on into wanting to be an emergency medical technician, paramedic, I did become an emergency medical technician, advanced cardiac life support paramedic, search and rescue specialist, hazmat, uh, worked in disaster management, scene management, I worked with the fire department. So I, I saw a tremendous amount of death, a tremendous amount of suffering on scene, suffering, cutting people out of cars uh, with, a, with a saw, with a K-12, with uh, the airbags. Uh, working with people that were trapped, and I was 17 years old when all of this started happening. Uh, very young to be in there cutting people out of cars with some dead in the back seat, some one dead in the front seat, and the driver trapped, uh, barely alive, having to get them out and, and assist in starting an IV, uh, maybe even intubating them in, in an upright position. Um, trying to control bleeding and trying to talk to them at, at the same time about, you know, with them asking you, am I going to die? Am I going to die? Very difficult situations that I think your audience needs to listen to and needs to try and comprehend uh, that side of life. Um, and there again, we're, all, we're leading up to empathy. And this is a strong case for empathy. Um, I was hardened at a very young age. Uh, as I moved on up the ladder in this business, I worked with the police, I worked with homicide, I was on the special forensics team going out and picking up homicide, so I jumped over into that. Uh, going out on the dead body squad, picking up uh, pieces and parts of bodies, uh, working with the police to go in and evaluate the scene. Uh, bagged the hands uh, of bodies who had been, you know, uh, we, we, well, evidence, 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 evidence working with uh, bodies who had been bloated up three weeks in the hot sun, five times their size. So this really s just put me in a universe all my own and uh, a universe separate from most common folks. So it kind of sets you apart in your own little world, your own little universe. Uh, this, I don't know what this did to me at a young age. I don't know how it affected me at a young age. I only know how it affected me later on. Uh, 
which was to give me uh, a lot of P PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, it really made me stop and think about God. It made me stop, and it will make you stop and think about why the hell are we here? Seeing all of this destruction and all of this chaos, is this all there is? It, you sometimes feel like that there is no goodness because you're so trapped inside that world of death that you just can't see any other way. So I had to really struggle to see the goodness outside of my work. I had to really struggle to see the happiness outside of my work. As I grew a little older, I started to realize, hey, this is good for me. This is teaching me something that most people would never have a chance to, to, to do or to see or to feel or to realize. There must be a reason why I'm here. Obviously, we need my kind of people that are doing this. Uh, to jump real quick, I did two major plane crashes also. That is one of the most dramatic things a human being can do is go into a scene where 400 bodies are laid out dead and trying to piece their parts and you know together and find fingers and heads and feet and this and that and the other. It's very, very traumatic and then stacking those bodies up in a diesel truck and taking them to the morgue and then taking them out again and then trying to repiece the parts from another truck. So. I had a nervous breakdown back when and uh, lost it, uh, completely lost it because of all of that. It all crept up on me. I was doing too much of it. I was involved uh, too deeply in it and um, I had to stop and I had to try to reorganize myself, my thoughts, my philosophy, my belief system. I needed God. I needed something, Buddha, Jesus. Uh, I needed something to come into my heart and try to solve some of this chaos and try to give me peace. So at that point in time, I'm kind of jumping forward now. I prayed, I meditated, and I asked God to please come in and tell me that there was some goodness somewhere in the world and that there was a reason for all of this madness and chaos. And, and he did. She did. It did. God did. Uh, God healed me one morning. I, I'd cried all night. My father had held my hand. My mother had held my hand. They'd sit by my bedside as I cried, and all of my dead bodies were, were floating in my head and chasing me. And I remember waking up the next morning with at, at peace. I prayed. My, my folks prayed for me. My grand came over and prayed for me. I remember waking up with a deep sense of peace and harmony and balance, and I remember thinking, you know, God, the source is the is the one who really knows about all of this. There must be a reason for this because if there wasn't we wouldn't be here. I'm not God, I'm only a man and I'm here to to serve God, I guess, to serve humanity and this job has to be done. So so be it. Here I am. I'm going to stop analyzing this to death. I'm going to stop uh, worrying so much and I'm going to just realize, hey, this is a job. Somebody's got to do it. It's helping a lot of folks being doing the job that we do helps a lot of folks indirectly that you never see so I had to really think about that and I developed a tremendous amount of empathy at that point I started really feeling for people I started really understanding other people's problems and other people's suffering and other people's confusion and disbelief and chaos so at that point I started counseling slowly I started helping other folks and I started listening to their People were drawn to me at that point. I don't know why, but people were drawn to me that had the same basic problems that I did, people that were women that were abused and battered, men that had PTSD from the war. And so I started counseling with people and loving them and holding their hand and just learning to listen to them, hmm. just listen to who they were and what they were about and where they were coming from when no one else would understand them. You know, so many times we go to a counselor and we feel like they're just not listening to us. They haven't walked in our shoes. They haven't experienced our life. And they really don't know what to tell us. And I think people were drawn to me because they knew of my background and they knew of the death and destruction that I had experienced. And they came to me for that reason because they knew I would understand the depth of their heart and their soul and their mind and that I wouldn't make fun of them or judge them or try to give them a pill for it or just say, well, you know, therapy might help. 
So that to me uh, really, really immersed me into empathy and compassion and intuitiveness. I want to, I want to bring that word in, intuitiveness and discernment. I learned to be intuitive. I learned to just look at someone and just feel their spirit and their heart and see their inside of them instead of what's outside of them. What's outside of them might be something I would hate in the human form. I might disagree with it. I might not even like them, and I might even shun them. But all of my background gave me the ability to go beyond the surface of man and look deep into the spirit and the heart of man and be able to connect with that. And that is just wonderful. And to this day, I'm proud of what I went through. I'm proud of what I experienced. And I think there was a reason for it. I don't know what that reason was in the, in the heavens or in the beyond. But it gave me a real sense of intuitiveness and love and deep, deep concern and caring for humanity. It's also, Edwin, as you already know, it's also made me very hardcore. It's made me very blunt. It's made me very, Edwin Rush can tell everybody out there how blunt Kyler Davenport is. It's made me very in your face, rubber meets the road, it is what it is kind of deal. I'm a realist. I don't like pamby wamby kind of touchy feely things. I like to get to the point. I like to dig deep into subjects. I like to debate subjects. Uh, so it's it's been a double edged sword. It's kind of been a curse and a blessing. Probably more of a blessing than a curse because it's allowed me to see the full expansiveness of man and woman and child and community and country, uh, precinct, prefecture, nation, state world universe hmm. well what I was uh, what kind of st struck me there was when you had your nervous breakdown I was seeing your your parents you, you said your parents were there with you and they were holding your hands and they stayed with you uh, it sounds like that rubbing, was they were rubbing my shoulders and letting me know that they really connected with me and they really loved me and that they really weren't there to try to fix me but they were there to empathize with me. Mm -hmm. If they would have tried to give me some philosophy or some scripture, I would have probably thrown them out of the room, but they didn't. They were there to love me through whatever I was going through. Wow. So how, how that, so that sounds like, a, for me, that's really what resonated, just seeing them there, that they were there to be present with you in this really difficult uh, time that you had. Yeah, it was a, it was amazing. My grandmother was one of the most wonderful women in the world. She used to rock in her little chair and sing uh, praises and and little songs, and she would do her fingers back and forth on the rocking chair. I'll never forget her. She had a little thing with her fingers, and she dipped snuff, and the snuff would always be hanging just a little bit out of the right corner of her mouth. But she was the sweetest woman, and she took me in after that. I stayed with her for a couple of weeks, and she. She loved me and made me poached eggs and toast, and we'd get up and have coffee together, and she would talk to me about the situation so sweetly. Uh, she was there for me. She was an open ear. She was an open soul. She was absorbing me and taking me in. Hmm. She knew what damage had been done to me. And, um, you know, I was also, I was also raped as a child with a gun by a very very mean and nasty person who had aborted his own wife's child by kicking her in the stomach this was a relative and he was a very mean person uh, I don't know how much of this I can share on the air but he was a top cop let's just say he was a top cop I, I grew up with CIA FBI, Secret Service, uh, Intelligence Division, um, back in the John F. Kennedy era. So uh, don't, I haven't told this on the air. You're the first exclusive that I've mentioned, I think, besides a couple of other shows I've alluded. But, um, yeah, that was also very traumatic to me. Uh, I was locked in a casket for 14 hours after that happened. And that also gave me strength. It gave me insight. It gave me the ability to really, really understand the depth of hurting of folks. 
Well, what I'm uh, looking at is, uh, you know, what are your needs and desires and yearnings for empathy? And it sounds like this was a kind of a real turning point. You were kind of in the dark. I mean, in dealing with all this human stress and pain and suffering, had your nervous breakdown, and and then uh, came out of it with a, a a sense of the importance of empathy and compassion and caring and and love, and that you've carried that forward. Now I'm just wondering how has been your experience with uh, with empathy since then uh, in terms of you know what how's your has it been all roses or is it a struggle? Do you struggle with empathy? Do you have are you getting the empathy you need from other people or no and neither are you. None of us are. We can always we can always find that road is long and twisted. It's hard. It's difficult because we were just talking about this yesterday. Um, this road of empathy is very, very long and very dark. It's not something that you just fall into one morning when you get out of bed. It has to be worked. It has to be trained. It has to be uh, seasoned. Uh, it has to be practiced. You can't just uh, get empathy. You have to develop empathy. You have to think about empathy. You have to practice em empathy with passion and intent. And also along the way, I think experiences help to, to grow empathy. Um, my empathy is deep, very deep, meaning that I can go to a child molester, I can go to an arsonist, a murderer, which I have in my halfway houses, and love them and forgive them and empathize with them and be with them. Now those that do not have empathy, true empathy, and I'd like to explain in a moment true empathy versus uh, counterfeit empathy. Uh, counter, okay, let's do it now. Counterfeit empathy is just pretending to really care about someone. Just kind of, okay, I'll get through this with you. I'll bring you a pie, a piece of pie and a cake, and do you need some milk and sugar? And I don't have very much time now. I've got to go. Uh, love you and pray for you. See you later. That's counterfeit empathy. Real empathy is being able to step out of your comfort zone, step out of your box and sacrifice the time that you wouldn't normally have. Just give it to them. Forget work, forget the family, forget everything, and just focus on that person. That's real empathy. Uh, this counterfeit empathy is cheap. It can be sold anywhere. It looks good, feels good, looks great on the billboards, it looks great on Edwin Rush's pages, but is it real? You know, that's that's what needs to be discussed. Is the difference in real empathy and counterfeit empathy? Um, but yes, I'm also hard. Uh, as I mentioned a while ago, I'm very hard. So to get to get to that part of me takes a while. You know, I, I discern people. I look at people. I want to know really kind of where are these people that need help? Who's helping them? Why are, why do they need help? How much help do they need? There is discernment. That's where discernment comes in. Because there's a lot of people that will go after your empathy and use you. That's a side that I've never heard Edwin Rush talk about. There's a there's a counterfeit side out there that it's pretend new age agape, new age counterfeit empathy, discernment, loving, blah, 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 blah. None of it's real. You've got to be able to discern and train people, say, well, are you really empathetic? Well, sure I am. I go to church, I carry a Bible, I meditate, I, I volunteer for my local homeless shelter. Doesn't mean a thing. Doesn't mean a thing. Hmm. So it's like a, a real empathy that you're looking for. It sounds like it's uh, an empathy or like a sacrifice or you really kind of give up something for someone else and you're willing to give up something and... Uh, that's maybe what you're considering the real empathy. Oh, I'm not considering it. It is. If you look at the research, if you're not willing to give the shirt off of your back, if you're not willing to give your shoes to, if you're not willing to give up the time that you would normally be at the country club, uh, you know, if you're going to be with them until your appointment comes up, that's not empathy at all. So uh, how is it uh, you're saying that you're so you're you have a need for empathy and you feel that that's not you're not getting the empathy you need from society or friends and I mean the real empathy then I mean that's so there's kind of a need you having a need for real empathy 
Let me tell you something, Edwin. It's not just me. <laughs> it's the whole world is in trouble. And Edwin Rush needs to be out there, and your organization needs to expand and grow to no end. Because you're doing a wonderful work, Edwin. But we have a lot of work to do in this department. We have a lot of uh, preachy, teachy stuff to do. I mean, you're so good sometimes that you're bad. I mean, you need to get out there. You and I had a conversation the other day about realism and your organization is needed all over the world. Your organization is needed in healthcare more than any place in the world, Edwin. Your organization is needed in schools more than anything in the world and churches more than anything in the world. Um, my need in empathy. Uh, I've laid up here after surgery with all of our Christian friends up here, all of our Buddhist friends up here never came when I was laying on the floor in a diaper after that rectal surgery. All of my felon friends, they came. All of my homeless friends, they came. All of my schizophrenic friends, they came. You might want to analyze that, Edwin. Where were my Buddhist friends? Where were my uppity, uppity Christian friends who live in the $200,000 homes? Why were the homeless the only ones that came and laid with me and touched my foot and loved me and told me everything was going to be all right and they would be here to the end? you have an answer for that? Yeah, it's, uh, it's like people who, ha who have uh, don't come and sacrifice, whereas people who don't have anything come and support. Yes. Yes. And we sure need more of all of this, and that's why I praise what you're doing so much. I just think that you're learning as I'm learning. You're frozen, by the way. Your picture's frozen. Can you still hear me? Um, yeah, I hear you, and uh, my picture here is okay, so I think we're still good. Yeah, I just want to thank you for all that you're doing, and I want to thank you for what you're what you're trying to do. I know I know that you're on a tough road, Edwin. I know you're on a tough road, and uh, I feel like you should be a little bit more hardcore with, <laughs> bumping, you know, knocking people over the head and letting uh -huh. them know that if we don't if we don't get what you're trying to teach them. Our world is going to continue to spiral down and down and down to the point of no return. I believe there. I believe that we're already there now. You know how hard and deep I study the Illuminati and the New World Order and the Council on Foreign Relations, United Nations. I mean, mm -hmm. I know that you probably don't want to bring this up in this interview, but we're to a point now where we're trying to get the age limit down to 12 so we can molest children in the United Nations. This is coming out of the UN. Our world is spiraling out of control morally. Uh, 10,000 new child porn sites coming online every day. Is that empathy, Edwin? Uh, United States Army involved in sex, tra sex trafficking. Is that empathy? The United States government uh, accused and indicted uh, individuals for ordering up uh, 9- and 10-year-olds to play with in, in, in Congress. Is that empathy? These folks are running our country. So where does that leave the average citizen like you and I that are out here preaching empathy and compassion and discernment and intuitiveness? Where does that leave us when our own leadership in this country has gone south? Yeah, you're, it sounds, you're kind of, what I'm kind of hearing there is it's uh, – the kind of the anti-empathy, unempathic force in society is so great that uh, to uh, de to bring more empathy in the world is going to take more of a more of an activist or maybe in your face uh, kind of a, an effort. You can't just say, "Oh, please be empathic," right? But maybe you know, get in the you know, get in uh, people's face kind of uh, approach or do something more activist. Uh, you know, like the civil rights was about really confronting the social structures that were uh, suppressing people. And loving people, like you said, Edwin, the other day, just loving people will show them. Setting the example will show them. Love them through their hate. Love them through their confusion. Love them through their violence. Love them no matter what. Not, not to say that you have to get beat up or stabbed by somebody, but love them no matter what. You know, the Bible says, uh, judge lest you be judged. In other words, you know, if I'm going to judge you, I'm being judged somewhere else. You know, it's not my job to judge you. It's my job to love you. And that's what, that's what, that's what it's really all about is we need to stop beating each other over the head and trying to sell each other our religion and how smart we are and how wise and how pretty and how good looking and how successful. We need to stop that ego thing. Ego gets in the way of empathy. Ego stops empathy cold. 
uh, me having a real self image of myself that's so great and so special stops empathy. So we need to all take a look at ourselves and we need to uh, go inside and introspect ourselves and say, who am I really? What am I all about? How much more would this help if I joined Edwin Rush's group? How much more could I learn about loving others and understanding others and helping others? That's what we need to do. You're on a ministry whether you like it or not. I mean, you can call it a ministry. Yeah. You have a mission and a ministry to inject love and compassion and empathy and discernment and intuitiveness and caring into the population. That's really your bottom line. And some of your critics might say, well, how in the world, Edwin, do you package that up without being a preacher or uh, opening a church? Or I mean, what is the, how do you sell that? And I think that's a big issue that you've brought up before. How, how do we sell that? Do we set up a tent somewhere? Do we offer cookies? Do we offer pamphlets? <laughs> oh, I remember the cookie story. I'm not going to mention it on air. Do we get stabbed? <laughs> uh, but, you know, it's like, uh, how do you sell that? It's, uh, it, it's a difficult question. You, uh -huh. you know what? I think we've reached an impetus here in the interview. That, that is a hard question. Yeah. And I'm going to throw it back to you. How do you sell that? How, how, you know, you can sell a new car. I, you can come into my car dealership and say, I want that one. Oh, my God, I love the color. I love the way it sounds. I'm, I'm, I'm sold. I love the seat covers. You can go in to buy a helicopter and say, well, I want a Ranger. Oh, that three-seater, four-seater is wonderful. You can go buy a house. But how does Edwin Rush and Kyler Davenport sell empathy? Yeah. Tell me. Yeah, it, it, it's really, it's about, well, what it is, is I'm looking for the needs. I'm doing a whole series of interviews around people's needs for uh, empathy. So this it kind of relates to that in terms of instead of like just pushing something out there, I'm, I'm looking for what are people's needs for empathy and then design something that addresses their needs for empathy. So it's a... It's an, a needs-finding approach that I'm trying now using human-centered design. Uh, and I think Edwin Rush needs to show empathy through action and through building in the community. I think one of the only ways, and this just came to me, we'll say the Holy Spirit gave it to me. <laughs> I think to talk about empathy, to talk about teaching empathy, to talk about educating people about empathy, I think that's empty. It's empty. It's completely empty. There's no substance to it. I think if Edwin Rush was building schools for children or assisting the homeless in finding housing and rehabilitation and stratifying them with the alcoholics and the drug addicts, I think if Edwin Rush was working with battered mothers, I think if you were promoting community development and critical outreach, I think that would give you substance. And mm -hmm. I think people would say, well, Edwin's not just a mouthpiece now for empathy, and it's empty at the end. What do we have? We, we, did, a, we did this hangout thing, but yet who got helped? Did, did somebody get some new clothes? Did somebody uh, Was a woman rescued from being battered? Was a child rescued from being molested? Was um, you know some of the folks in Syria helped or the Philippines? Or what is Edwin doing? What is Edwin doing to put himself out there to sacrifice Edwin's time. Uh, I think people are going to follow action. They're going to follow yeah. you when you act and yeah. some of your folks act. What's Edwin and Kyler doing? Are they working together? Oh, I see that they're not working together. Edwin doesn't like some of the things Kyler does and Kyler doesn't like some of the things Edwin does. So they're just mouthpieces. They get together every six months and have a hangout show. That will not work. Yeah, so it's really about action, actually doing something that contributes to people's welfare. To the community. To the community. Because that's what, that was the question was, is I was saying that you have a need to get empathy out there. That's really a need that you have. It's a need that I have as well, is how to, looking for ways of getting empathy out into society, dealing me, with all those unempathic uh Let me tell you what forces. we do. So. We we visit with the sick and the and the dying in the nursing homes and the assisted living centers. We go hold their hands and read them stories, and I play the piano and the guitar, and I teach Sunday school uh, twice a month. And we go visit the different homes and take balloons and cards and teddy bears and different things. That's empathy too. Um, we work with the homeless over 60 years old and some of the younger ones. 
we work with battered mothers and schizophrenics up here. We go where most will never go. We go where most do not want to go and should not go because they don't have the skill sets to do that. So when you do that, you are promoting, not just promoting empathy, not just teaching empathy, but you're living empathy. So that's one thing that I think is most important is to get involved and be very active in the empathetic process. Empathy is not a word that stands alone any more than love can stand alone. People need to see love in action. They need to see empathy in action. So uh, I'm, not, I'm not telling you what to do with your organization, but I would suggest and advise strongly that you find a way to uh, start talking to people about how much do you sacrifice. I think you should get in people's face a little bit and say on these hangouts, you know, what do you do? What do you sacrifice in your life for others? How much do you reach out of your comfort zone to others? Or is it just comfortable for you? Is it only when you're free time? Is it only when you have some extra money to throw at someone? I think that's important. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot there. There's the one thing is about the sacrifice. One concern I have about sacrifice is in the especially in the 50s it was the idea was that women were stayed at home and they kind of sacrificed themselves for their family and so they are really not seen I mean, this is for who they are and what their own needs were and so in, in the long term it's not sustainable it seems to me there needs to be a, a, a shared empathy you cannot just be empathic in the world on your own and not really be able to share your needs so we need uh, uh, a way need where it's yeah. yeah that there's a family I mean that's what I've been working on is family empathy circles I've been doing it with my uh, family and I've mentioned that to you that it's really you know in the family that it's a supportive uh, a mutual empathy there's a mutual listening a mutual sharing and uh, so I'm, I'm concerned about this uh, notion of Empathy being self-sacrifice because for me that's um, it's it's not empathizing with yourself. There's a you have to empathize with yourself as well as others, and then also get the empathy be heard yourself. So we need to create that that re those empathic relationships. With, okay, with let's okay. Other. You you brought up a good point. I don't know I don't know how much time we have here, but you brought up a very good point. We talked about this yesterday and the day before on my shows. Empathy comes through maturity. It comes through self-examination. It comes through self-introspection. And it comes through experiences. And it's like you can't keep going back and licking up your same old vomit, you know, a person that just continues to commit criminal acts or whatever. You can't, you can't really develop empathy as long as you're on that negative path. You have to, at some point in time, start to become a master, go, go toward the master way, you know, and learn from your mistakes. Empathy is all about experience. It's not a word, it's an experience. So I, I hear what you're, what I think you're saying, and that is that we need to live it, but in order to live it, our society has to change, Edwin. Yeah. Our society is We need to we need fast. to experience. Uh, yes. oh, you're say, sorry, you're saying or that society needs to change. Uh -huh. Society needs to change. And ask any pastor, ask any philosopher, ask any scientist, society needs to change. We're on a downhill course. We're on a downhill course. Why are we on a downhill course? Because we've lost our spiritual roots. We've lost our ability to really understand where we come from, where we may have come from, where we are, why we're here, and where we're going. So many people are confused about these issues. Old-time religion is gone, and life has become so complex that there's just too many things going on in too many places with too many people and the populations are exploding the technology is exploding and I think empathy has gotten lost in that shuffle in that in that whole thing empathy and compassion have just been quashed so the the empathy is is squashed by just all the other stuff that's going on and there's a need to uh, to raise it and the resurrect, to resurrect, resurrect, resurrect the empathy and compassion. Yes, and then there's kind of a need. You have a need of finding ways of resurrecting that. And what what have you found to be the best way for the, that's been working for you, or, or what has worked and what hasn't worked? I I talk to people. 
openly. Uh, I'm not afraid to voice my opinion about prayer or meditation or love or God or just getting together and just dancing or just being together around the campfire, just opening up to people, letting them know that I'm here if they need me. They can talk to me. They can relate to me. Um, letting them know that I'm just like them. I'm not going to judge them. I'm not here to judge you. I'm simply here to be a listening post for you. It's hard to get people to believe you're real nowadays. This is another thing. Is every, Everyone is so paranoid of each other. I don't know where that came from. This is another show, but where did all this paranoia come from? You know, Edwin's a cult leader and Kyler Davenport's a cult leader and they're they're running all these weird things and they're dancing around. I mean, people are paranoid. They're they're uh, pointing the finger. They're 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 ready to accuse. Uh, they're pent up. They're stressed out. So, uh, going along with society, going along with this population explosion and the explosion of technology and all these other things. That's gotten quashed. We've made each, we've made everybody paranoid with the NSA tracking and tracing, the DOD tracking and tracing, the FBI tracking and tracing. With all of the profile, right now our faces are being profiled with the NSA. Right now, as you and I sit here, they know everything about you, your 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 mate, your everything you've bought in that room behind you. They're tracking and tracing you. See, so. Uh, we, we've become a very 1984, you know, kind of society. So there again, people are like, "Well, my God, I don't have time to be empathetic because I'm so afraid of everyone." Mm -hmm. So it's really the fear. The fear is uh, the fear and the anxiety and the paranoia and all that whole constellation of emotions around fear is out there, and it's it's just in, it's inhibiting the empathy. So. Yes, uh, it's like we're coming up against that fear, that inhibition, that inhibiting of empathy through fear. And how do you bring? How are you dealing with fear and empathy? Then how you know? How do you address that? Uh, by preaching and teaching uh -huh. uh, that we need to, we need to, we need to get out of ourselves a little bit and and give time to the to the universe, to the world, to humanity. We need to stop being so self grandized and self pent up and look at the me 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 look at the I I I I'm on the Edwin Rush show look at me 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 we need to stop that we need to be able to give of ourselves just give freely of ourselves and get out of ourselves and try to quash that ego try to calm that ego down it's very difficult to help anyone truly when your ego is the size of New York City and you think you're so damn special and that's what I've always admired about you is you don't think you're so damn special you know you you are a very sweet kind and loving person and it shows in your face it shows in your actions it shows in your words so you're a living example of empathy and that's what we need to teach that's what you need to reflect by example to other people how can you be more like me? I know that sounds a little selfish, but honestly, how can you be a little more like me? And how can we teach them to be a little more like us? And then that will grow exponentially. Uh, I was also going to say that we have such uh, we have such a society that's bent on things. Let's go out and get some more things. Um, you know, people need to turn loose of this idea that things are good. Things are not necessarily good, you know. Things can overshadow goodness, and your 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 uh, desire and your passion to go out and have more and more and more and more and more can keep you from being empathetic. It can completely overshadow any hope for empathy and compassion. You know, it seems like the more people have, you and I mentioned this the other day, I think, or you did. It seems like the more people have, the less they understand what's down here where the needs are the true needs are you know yeah well that's uh, yeah um, for me the, uh, the you know you're talking about the fear and anxiety and paranoia and it seems to me that that's really a real core of the blocks to uh, empathy and I, I'm wondering in terms of uh, your needs for empathy how you know how are your if you have any stories of dealing with fears, how you've dealt with fears or your anxieties in an empathic way, how do you, how does, how do you overcome your fears? It's like I, I'm hearing that you're 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 trying to reach out, you're trying to dialogue with people, 
and uh, uh, you know what do you well, do? Well, you run your fear? you run into a lot of brick walls when you're loving and kind. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay, first of all, you run into a tremendous amount of of uh, uh, what 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 would be the word? Uh, you run into a lot of walls when you're true. When you want to be true and you want to be true blue and you're really real and you want to reach out to people, people sometimes see that as a con. Uh -huh. Why uh -huh. is he doing that? Why uh -huh. are they doing that? Are they wanting money? Uh, what what kind of a game are they playing? There again, we go back to the scams that are going on today and the spammers and this and that and the other. Um, I, I see the question you're trying to pull out of me. Um, you have to get rid of your fear. I'm going to use you as an example. If you wanted to go out and set up a tent or two, you don't. You, you can't go in with any fear at all about. Oh, what are people going to think about this? How's it going to work? Oh my gosh, is it going to be this or that? We got to worry about permits. Oh my God, is it? You can't worry about any of that. Go as a little child. Just go out there as a little child, but be mature, be adult, and just love people and just talk about empathy and compassion and don't have fear. Fear will quash your mission. Fear will quash your passion. Fear will keep you in the house on the computer. And so if you're afraid of all of the negativity that's out there and the paranoia that's out there and the doubt that's out there, you'll never overcome that. You know, and that's what do I've you, learned to uh -huh. do. That's what I've learned. Do you to see do. it as that you have to just kind of do it by force of will? Or do you need empathy, Kyler? I mean, as a person here, I guess you're in in, in Washington, or yeah. where you're located, Oregon. That, it, Oregon. Do you you know you can that fear is that you're saying well you're putting yourself out there and people are judging or they're paranoid of you, but you know, do you need empathy? Do you need to be heard? Do you need to feel yes. that people are really listening to you to yes. overcome your own fear? It's a very lonely world when one has mastered this moment, when one has come up into this realization, when one has been able to overcome the lower base qualities of the brain and been able to expand into this higher consciousness, it becomes a very lonesome world. You're going to start seeing just how horrible everything really is. That's the first obstacle of becoming enlightened or awake is you're going to start seeing just how terrible everything really is and how horrible everything has really become and so that could depress you mm -hmm. that could make you not even want to go out there and face it so 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 yes uh, it, it's very very difficult and I do need empathy yes I do need someone to listen to me this today is helping me you are helping me this this is an example of what your question is all about for this show. What we're doing right here is the answer. Yeah, that's what that's uh, one thing I've been finding is yeah, it's this listening that you find is 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 being heard and getting the empathy that you're needing. So it, it, I'm hearing that that's like beneficial to you. It's like it's making you feel heard and there's a sense of connection between us. It's beneficial to 7.5 billion people. <laughs> And, and yeah, and the one thing I've been doing was wanting to start is like empathy circles around our fears and anxieties. So I've been seeing that uh, it's really these fears, anxieties, and paranoias, and that whole constellation of feelings around that that is inhibiting our empathy. And even the um, I'm just wondering how this resonates with you. And even the um, the the ego that you're talking about that the ego is just another word for fear you know it's like a, it's like the it's just the word for a way of trying to deal with one's fear mm -hmm. so what we really need to do is start talking about what do we really fear and have that be heard and to share our fears and share you know honestly and openly and I'm wondering just how that if if that Resonate. Sharing is important. Having a safe environment to share in is another thing that you'll have to <laughs> overcome, that I have to overcome. You first have to give people an environment of safety where they feel like you're not going to shoot bullets back at them when they tell you something. Because when people, when people start to open up, even on your shows and your hangouts, when people start to open up, many of them are afraid. Many of them are afraid that they don't know who Edwin Rush is. They really don't know what this organization is about. So you're going to have to create a way for them to come in safely 
and easily and feel like that this is a place where they can be safe and not harmed for telling what's inside of them. People heal when they tell what's inside of them. They heal, Edwin. So another part of your situation should be like confession. You're almost like a priest in a way because people are coming to confess. And that's, I'm sorry, that may have thrown you off a little, but that's the truth. No, it doesn't. But it, all the things you said made sense even about, it's almost like a, a religious, it's an empathy Very, movement is like, a, is like a church in a sense. It has a similar kind of, in that, you know, you have someone who's holding the space, the minister, that mm -hmm. creates the congregation that we almost I'm almost thinking that we need uh, like empathy church you know it doesn't have to be the word church but uh well people would love that I'd love to yeah. be one of your co-pastors in the empathy for the church of empathy and compassion what a wonderful church what a wonderful you know the Unitarian Universalists are doing it perfectly they're they're doing it perfectly if you wanted to follow a uh, group if you wanted to uh, mirror something that was successful, look at Unitarian Universalist and go read their mission statement. My God, how powerful is that? I looked at it the other day, I almost fell on the floor. I mean, uh, yeah, the Church of Empathy and Compassion, and we could all get our little doctrinates and your studies, and you could give us certificates for... <laughs> no, really? Yeah. Really? Well, you need that. It's that we need like something like that, where yeah. there is someone that holds the space for it, because that's very much what a minister or priest does, is they go to people's homes, they listen, like, what are your problems? How can I, you know, help? Heal the family, yes. you know, creating family support, empathy circles, creating a sense of community. It's almost like we need, it's like it's such a big job to change the whole society, but if we can have small groups yes. that yes. are supportive and that there's someone who's like a, has the role of similar to a minister that is supported by the community because somebody's got to get paid to. Uh, yes. To do all this work, just like a minister. If you had one in each state, it would change the world a little yeah. bit. Just one group would expand in each. You know, you know, it could be a place where people come twice a month, once a week, whatever, and just learn and get new doc, get new pe pieces of information from you and interviews, and take home and look at interviews you're doing, and take home some written material about empathy, and compassion, discernment, and so forth. And uh, you could have get-togethers. They could have sing-alongs. They could do kind of their yeah. own things, you know, dance together. They could do whatever, whatever that was in the guy within Music, the guidelines. Music, singing, yeah, you know, all those things. Tell to stories. Bring people to get, tell storytelling. Uh, have, poetry, uh -huh. poetry. Small uh, group discussions, creating family empathy circles. You know, helping people with their fam. I mean, family conflicts is huge. You know, oh and people God. need people need support in the family. Yes, and you know it would heal so many families and so many people to know that something something like this was out here. The Church of Empathy and Compassion. Look, Edwin, if the Church of Scientology is doing good and the Church of Satan is doing good, what the <laughs> hell are we? What the hell are we waiting for here? You know, I mean, let's fight this. There's a lot of you know yin and yang. You know. And I believe if the duality, we live under this duality in this third dimension of space-time. And I believe that good is good. There is good. I know that you're not one of these people that says, well, there's no good and bad. Everything is just whatever. No, there has to be some good and bad. <laughs> and so we should do as much good as possible with your organization to overcome what we said earlier, all the fear and the paranoia and the stress and the depression and the doubt. and the, That's what really this would be all about is to take this into the communities and speak at the yeah. libraries. Your ministers could speak at the libraries about empathy and compassion. They could speak at City Hall. They could go to schools. And, oh, I know what I was going to say. Last thing. Don't rule out. I would advise you not to rule out or try to control whether these groups became Christian or Buddhist or Hindu or whatever. I wouldn't, I wouldn't dare say, well, now, we don't want any Christians in there. We can't have any Muslims in there. We can't. It would be a diverse, like the Unitarian Universalist. Mm -hmm. Come one, come all. This is about yeah. all of us coming together to heal the community and to heal each other and to lift each other up. Come one, come all. Come Buddhist, come Christian, come Muslim, come Hindu, come whatever. 
come Bhagavad God Gita, whatever, Krishna. This is not about labeling. It's not about dogma. It's not about creed. It's not even about tradition. It's about healing this nation in a small way that we can and opening up positive dialogue about empathy and compassion. Well, I put it out there as a Facebook uh, event just to see how much you know interest and support and it didn't you know it did I I, it, I did some needs uh, empathy uh, interviews and I kept hearing you know, I interviewed some people just around this oh, what, what would you need in a church of empathy for example and they're all saying oh yeah I really want it I really want it but I'm not seeing like you're all enthusiastic about it I don't see the the action part like if there's such hopelessness like oh it's almost like hopeless you know, I want it, I need it, I see that, you know, I came from a family that, you know, a couple of people told me this, from Christian families, we had all this support, but I couldn't get into the dogma, you know, it, to get into the, the church, into the community, you had well, to buy this dogma, but I didn't see the um, mm, the uh, energy to really put time and energy into it. Edwin, people might subconsciously think that it's a cult. I've heard that about you, and I've heard that about me. You and I both have been <laughs> accused of being cult leaders. I haven't heard that, but I'll take your word for it. Yeah, it's well, it's nor it's natural. It's natural. You and I are strong leaders, and we have this thing, these things, and we're not exactly. You can't label us. You can't pigeonhole us. That's pe when you can't pigeonhole somebody, they're going to be called a cult leader or a new age nut or whatever. Okay, remember that, please. Uh, so I think the first thing would be to teach these people that you're not a cult. You're not some new age nutty bunch that's going to be dancing naked around the campfire. It's it's. You're, you're simply trying to heal. You're simply trying to bring goodness to the world. And that's kind of corny. People will say, oh, that's corny. What? Goodness to the world? This is such an evil world. How could you possibly bring goodness? Well, there you go. There's your challenge. There's your challenge is to bring goodness to the world and bring a pure heart to the world and teach people how to reach out to others in need. That's what it's all about. And here, we, here we're back to the church thing, Edwin. That's church. Yeah. Well, I'm. I was trying to hear your needs for empathy. You're kind of giving me. I'm feeling I'm getting a bit of advice here. Um, well, what's wrong with that? <laughs> you have a need for giving advice. <laughs> I'm an I'm an interviewer too. So you're. You, it's hard to host to host. It's hard. We talked about this last night. It's hard when two strong hosts get on with two big organizations. It's difficult for us to ever. <laughs> you're trying to get something out of me. I'm trying to get something out of you all at the same time. Yeah. Well, I, I really hear that then. It sounds like the whole church, the group, the community of empathy really resonates. And I have I did a lot uh, online. You know, I, I did a bunch of stuff in person. We used to have meetings here in my house for almost six months, empathy group. And then it kind of like uh, fell apart. And I think it, came, it was about not having enough skill and, you know, really having learned how to uh, be more empathic and have some skills around it. Then I went online, did a lot online, and now me, I'm feeling the sense of wanting to uh, do more in person. So, please. Let me ask you something, and this is going to be a tough question for Edwin Rush. This is going to be one of those uh, Barbara Walters, my old boss's questions. What does Edwin Rush do to get his hands really dirty in the community of danger out there in the ghetto and with the prostitutes and the drug addicts with the needles in both arms like I work with up here on the curb. I got blood I can take a picture of and show you right now on the curb out here from blood in both arms shooting up last night, counseling and loving her. What does Edwin Rush do that would be in a shining example for the Church of Empathy and Compassion? Mm. Well, yeah, it's like in terms of being in the down and out areas of town. Um, all of it, all of it, all wow. of it. Putting yourself really out in it. danger. How many times do you go out the homeless shelter and work with the homeless and serve? How many times have you served at the homeless shelter once a month? How many times have you, I can see you're a little nervous, and I'm glad. I get nervous, too. <laughs> How many times have you worked with the prostitutes on the street? How many times have you handed out tracts about empathy and compassion and said, we have a center we're building to come to and have uh, Kyler Davenport speak and Edwin Rush speak and some of our others speak? How many times have you worked with the hardcore drug addicts and the alcoholics or the battered women that are being beat up and how many times have you invited the homeless into your home like we do here four times a week uh, to take a bath because they're so dirty and so filthy and so stinky and they love us and so much 
please tell me honestly. Yeah, well, I've they. Um, How I've, many times? I had I have been out to the Occupy, so I went out to the Occupy. No, and that's just having fun. The, that's having fun. <laughs> yeah, I'm talking about really nasty, dirty, hard stuff. Yeah, I haven't I haven't brought dirty, nasty, hard stuff into the house. That's why that's your important. organization uh -huh. is not where you want it to be yet, and you have all the skill, you have all the love and the depth of quality, that you have the compassion, you have everything in there. But God is waiting for you to go out and do what you're trying to teach other people to do and take that word empathy and turn it into something physical and something real that Edwin Rush is doing. And yeah. then people will follow you and then people will participate and then your organization will grow exponentially. Yeah, you're, it's like I'm really hearing it's about you're feeling that uh, the, it's the action part. If you can really do action, get That's out there, actually doing something. Hands down. And hands down, and that the action part is kind of what's what you're seeing is maybe missing, and and that's um, it's not what I'm seeing. Okay. It's what it's what is. Trust it's what is the action part. That's that's it. Words are nothing. Hangouts are nothing. When you start talking to people about what are you doing to give back, what are you doing to reach out of your comfort zone, you're just gonna fly. When you start bringing advocates in like myself who work with the hardcore drug addicts and the battered women and the children who were molested and the alcoholics, then you're going to start to really fly. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I, 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 I see what you're saying about really dealing with the heart. It's kind of like going to the pain, like to deal, you know, to, to really foster empathy, foster compassion. We have to go to where the greatest pain is, uh, maybe. But I see pain everywhere too. You have you know, to start that, that somewhere. There is there's pain in my family. There's pain in my life. There's pain in my relationships. And so I'm kind of and then even online, you know. So I don't want to diminish, you know, any anybody's pain. Say so you only have to go to the hardest core. That there's you know it's everywhere. And well, I, but I hear what you're saying too. That that if you go to the deepest pain, the deepest you know suffering. And be present there with them. It helps and you. Yeah. It helps you. It heals you. It teaches you. It instructs you. When you go put yourself in a position where you really don't know how to react, or you go down to the nursing home and find a couple, three or four patients who've never had a visitor. By the way, there's hundreds of thousands of those down, and there's hundreds of them down the street from you. When you go walk in there and say, I just want to visit someone who doesn't have any. I have the Center for Empathy and Compassion. I just want to visit someone who never has a visitor. Just go in there and look at them and sit down and hold their hand for a half hour. Read them a story. Your whole life will change. You've got to put yourself out there. You'll come back to this thing here and you'll, you'll, you'll be a whole new person when you go visit with those old folks who are suffering and dying. Go to a hospice patient and hold their hand for a while that's never had a visitor and come back to this program here so you're wanting so you're wanting me as well as I, I would imagine everyone, everyone else to go out to really go out to look for where the suffering is where the the pain is and be present with the pain and suffering and and the fear maybe too and that's how it will how it will change is go be present with that and be present with the suffering and learn empathy from the source. You can't learn empathy out of a book or a hangout or a, a lecture. It comes from trying to get everyone involved in the community of change. It, it comes from bringing people together and forming a union, a fellowship, and then for those to go out and do what they possibly can with the resources they have to help others. To spread. You have to do it physically though. Faith without works is dead and that's in Buddhism, that's in Christianity, that's in uh, the Quran. Faith without works is dead. Empathy without works is even deader. Compassion without physical involvement and putting yourself out there is dead as a doornail. So it's all about the physical progress, the physical interaction with the world of suffering that creates, brings these words up and out and resurrects them. Well, you were saying that in our dialogue that you're finding that uh, supportive, uh, that 
I, there's a sense for me. There's a sense that uh, if we do have these dialogues, if we do connect with people, that there is empathy there. So it's in all the relationships. That sure. I feel a little concerned that if we kind of demean and say, "Well, you're not being empathic," you know, that it in in our day-to-day -day relationships, because there's a lot of pain in just even in in with wealthy people. I mean, I mean, I see it that they have all kinds of dysfunction in their okay. families, and there's a huge amount of pain. They might have the money to go pay for a therapist. But within you know, so that there's so there's pain everywhere. They it's would not, get more from you than they would a therapist. Honestly, they would. Yeah. Uh, I see what you're saying, but but still, remember now we're not we're not negating one part of this. We're or, you know we're we're just talking about one one little part of this. Uh huh. Okay. Yes, I see your point that we shouldn't negate someone's empathy they already have, and of course not. There's going to be people come on hangouts and say, "Well, sure, I go, I go feed the homeless. I work with the battered women. I help build the community gardens. I'm helping to dig wells, plant trees. Sure, and that's empathy. That's that's empathy for Mother Earth and Gaia. Um, but you should stress the physical part of it, and you should stress that the center for empathy and compassion is not just w about words, empty words. That you're looking for measurable results." As a scientist, as a researcher, as a director of your organization, you're looking for results-oriented people. Mm -hmm. you yeah, see, doing you, something. Yeah, you creating, can't be yeah. afraid to ask for that. You can't be wamby pamby with that. You've got to demand measurable results. Is what Edwin Rush should be looking for. Well, how <laughs> this is the need, your needs of empathy. So how is that working for you in terms Great. of? Great. Uh -huh. You never read me because you and I don't have time to read each other. I've got over 2,000 articles around the world about this. I'll send you some of them. Uh, you know, I write about this. I write about physical interaction with the world and reaching out beyond your comfort zone. I write about uh, learning to relate to suffering, relate to the things you disagree with, relate to the things you're afraid of. All of this creates an atmosphere for empathy. You can't just stay in your house and read books on psycho cybernetics and winning friends and influencing people and Edwin Rush's empathy and compassion. You can't. That's worthless. Completely worthless. If your wife comes home and you slap her, you know what I'm saying? You've got to get it in you. You got yeah. to get it in you. It's got to become a part of you. So you can't just like study it. You have to. Um, have to you're wanting to live live empathy and and. Have those relation, those empathic relationships. If we had that right now, we wouldn't be in deficit in the United States. We wouldn't be living under this regime that we're living under, and we wouldn't be in such trouble in this nation right now. If we had what you're promoting. Well, um, we've gone for about an hour, so maybe we want to wrap wrap this up. Is there any kind of final? Uh, you know, have you have you felt heard? Have, have you felt? Oh, heard? I have felt wonderfully heard. <laughs> Okay. I just hope that this does not become an empty road, a dead end road. Uh -huh. I hope that we continue with each other to show others that we can work together, we can continue on with continuity and that we can we can make progress together. If you and I have this discussion and then separate, what's empathetic about us with each other? Cuz I have needs and you know what those needs are. You have needs. So why don't we just kind of stick together as much as we can? I'll promote the or your organization. I don't expect you to promote all of mine because I'm the shock jock, so that's not a good mix. Some of my stuff is a good mix, though. You should have a little time extra to find. I'll send you some of my good articles and maybe post those in the Empathy and Compassion. Okay, so, yes, and this, if it's around empathy. Yeah, I would, I would, I would like to great. leave it. I uh -huh. would like to leave you with a quote by Dr. Edward J. Pullman that I live by: "Whatever you vividly imagine, ardently desire." And enthusiastically act upon will come to pass. Okay, with that, Kyler Davenport. Do you have a website? Uh, yes, Google me, Kyler Davenport, or go to blogtalkradio.com forward slash Kyler dash Davenport dash live, or you can find me on destinyradionetwork.com, that's destiny, D-E-S-T-I-N-I-E, 
I'm also broadcasting live all over the UK on MSIRadio.com and uh, check out United Caregivers of America dot org for the old folks that we take care of around the United States. Thank you, Edwin, very much for having me on.